Guess what today is, family? First John. Yes, we are going to have a wonderful time in the book of of First John. Now, First John is kind of an uh, it's an an in your face kind of book, but that's okay sometimes, right? It's okay just to have it all placed out right in front of you. Before we get going, let me give you the background of. First John. Uh, the book is named after its author. Uh, John is one of the sons of Zebedee. He was named by Jesus as one of the sons of thunder. John wrote uh, the Gospel of John, and he wrote the first, second, and third book of John, and also the book of Revelation. At this time in our text, John is the only remaining original apostle. Everyone else has died a violent death, and they tried to kill John by dumping him in a cauldron of boiling oil. And he survived, and they exiled him to the island of Patmos, where he penned the book of Revelation. So John is the only of the original 12 apostles left. He is very elderly at this time as he's writing John is the last eyewitness of the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So you can imagine when John is talking, everyone's going, John was with Jesus throughout his entire earthly ministry. Death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. This John that we are hearing speaking, he is the only one that is left. Most believe that the letter was written before 95 AD. Uh, After 95 AD, there was a severe persecution and massacre by Domitian, and John did not mention uh, this persecution. So many believe the letter was written before that. The reason for the letter, let me give you two quotes. The first one is from John MacArthur. He says, this epistle provides for us a powerful message for a compromising, convictionless, open-minded, permissive, and liberal thinking church. J. Vernon McGee says it like this. He says, Christianity wasn't in danger of being destroyed. It was in danger of being changed. Sounds a lot like today. The main issues of our text that we're going to be in in a couple, for a couple weeks was Gnosticism. The word uh, Gnosti- Gnostic means knowledge. So there was this teaching that was going around that there were only a few that had this higher knowledge. So since you have higher knowledge, they wanted to spread this quote-unquote higher knowledge with the feeble ones. The main issue of, well, many issues with Gnosticism, but one of their main teachings was that all matter was evil, That matter was bad, that the only thing that really actually counted, that was really important, was the spirit. So they taught that you can live and do whatever you want with the flesh because it didn't matter. What actually mattered was the spirit. So go live however you want to live, and that doesn't matter. You won't be sinning at all because flesh, all flesh is bad. Now, if you're listening to me, you're probably jumping forward a little bit. So that would mean... God becoming a man would be an impossibility. Why? Because all matter is evil or bad. So why would God clothe himself in human flesh since flesh is evil? So thus the teaching was that Jesus was not God. This was a further Uh, promoted by Arius, which the Jehovah's Witnesses get their teaching that Jesus was a created being. So this was creeping into the church. So John is writing to correct this heretical teaching. Gnosticism was further developed, and it began to spread wide through the church. So again, Christianity wasn't in danger of being destroyed. It was in danger of being changed. So this is a small little background of the book of 1 John. It's a book to recall us or to bring us back to the fundamentals of the Christian faith. John is speaking to believers. So the audience, they're all believers. No one in John's audience is a non-believer. So he's talking to Christians and he's very concerned 
with their relationship with God. So as we go through this book of 1 John, it's really important to remember the background of our text. Because John's going to say a lot of things regarding sin, uh, regarding salvation. If you don't remember the background, you may take it out of context. But the book of 1 John is so, so beautiful. The title of the message is Full of Joy. If I were to ask all of you, do you want to be filled with joy? I'm sure all of us would say, of course I want to be filled with joy, pastor man. Well, what's great about 1 John is John wants his, uh, his hearers to know joy, to know holiness, and also to know assurance of their salvation. Once in a while, someone will say, well, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm really saved. And maybe that's run through your mind a couple of times. Well, am I Am I really a, a Christian? Am I, am I really saved? Is there a, a way for, for me to know? Well, by the time we finish 1 John, you should know. You're definitely going to hear that we can have 100% certainty of our salvation. When it comes to holiness, did you know that God wants us to live holy lives? Kind of difficult in this day and age that we live today, but Jesus still wants us to live holy lives. So with that background, turning your Bibles to 1 John. And 1 John is in the New Testament, and the quickest way to it is turn to the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, and make a left-hand turn. 1 John. We're going to look at verses 1 through 10 as we talk about being full of joy. And when you get there, give me an amen. amen. First John chapter 1, it says this. John begins, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your what? Your joy may be full. Let's stop there for just a couple of minutes. Our first point this morning, if you're taking some notes, is knowing Jesus is, is joy. How beautiful that John opens up the way that he does. And if you've read the New Testament, you know that the Gospel of John, he opens up very much the way that he does here. So the Gnostics believe that all manner was evil, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. So what does John do? He lets his hearers know, let me tell you something. I walked with Jesus. I heard Jesus. I was around for his ministry. I saw his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. I want you to know that I was with Jesus. He wants his hearers to know that Jesus wasn't some type of emanation, that he wasn't just, just a man, but he was God in human Form. Let me read to you 1 John, or John chapter 1 of the gospel. John says, in the beginning was what? The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's a pretty good way to start a book, right? In the beginning was the Word, the, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Everybody still together? So far, okay. If not, raise your hand and we can slow down a little bit. So we have the word in the beginning was God, and then the word was with God, okay? The word was with God, okay? And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. All things were made through him. Gets even better. It says, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So this is beautiful. So in the beginning, there was the word. That's Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus. Jesus was with the Father. Still, still together? It gets even better. Look into verse 14. And the word became what? 
flesh and dwelt among us. So John is letting here his hearers know, no, in the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the, the Logos, was with the Father, and then the Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. So you can imagine that the hearers are going, wait a minute, the Gnostics are teaching that the Word did not become flesh. They are talking about how Jesus is created. So the next time someone comes to your door, take them to 1 John, first of all, then take them to John chapter 1. By him, all things were created. Now, you might be thinking, now, why does all of this really matter? It matters a whole bunch. It matters a whole bunch. It matters so, so important. Because if you don't have the right Jesus you're probably not going to spend eternity in the right place. Having the right Jesus is very, very important. Think about this, family. If Jesus is not God and didn't come in the flesh, you and I are still in our sins. Think about that. You and I are still in our sins. If God did not clothe himself in human form, if God did not die on a cross, you and I are still in our sins. If God did not resurrect himself from the dead, when you and I die, we're going to remain in the, in the grave. So since Jesus is God, since he did come in the flesh, since he did give his life on a cross, since he did rise himself from the, from the grave and ascend into heaven, guess what? We have a high priest. And if you ladies go to the women's study, you learned about that. We have a high priest, according to the book of Hebrews. So Jesus is praying for us. If Jesus is not the God-man, then what we're doing here is wasting our time. So John wants his hearers to know that we can have this, this fellowship, not only fellowship, but we can have this thing called joy. And I love John. He says, we've heard, we've seen, we've looked at, our hands have touched. In John chapter, uh, chapter 20, uh, after Jesus' uh, resurrection, he appeared to the disciples, and, but Thomas wasn't there. So the disciples said, hey, Thomas, we've seen Jesus. Thomas says, you know what? I don't believe you. I don't believe you. Listen to what John chapter 20, verse 26 through 29 says. It says, and after eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. And Jesus came, and the doors being shut, he stood in the midst, and he said, peace to you. Then he says to Thomas, he says, reach your, your finger here and look at my hands, and reach your hand here and put it into my side. He says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, listen to this in verse 28, my Lord and my God. So when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, point them to this because they forgot to delete this out of, uh, out of their Bible. My Lord and my God. He says, my Lord and my God. This, he's speaking of, of Jesus. He's speaking of Jesus, so family, it's very important to understand that. Jesus had to be 100% God and also 100% man that you and I might have forgiveness of sins and have hope. And what joy it is to know that our Savior knows what it's like to, to be tempted, to be tested. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to hurt. He knows what it's like to cry. Think about this. Are you ready? God cries. The creator of the universe cried at the tomb of Lazarus. We've all cried. We know we cry when, when this thing hurts right here, right? The creator of the universe knows your pain, knows your suffering. So for somebody to say that Jesus was just a man, oh my goodness, talk about trying to rob you of your joy. Talking about how, wow, Jesus doesn't know what I'm going through. That's why John is trying to set everything straight. Jesus is saying to, to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen, but yet believe. That's us. That's us. Blessed are we who have not seen but believed. Think about this, family. There were many during uh, Jesus' time that actually saw him and, and still didn't follow him. Think about how blessed we are. We've not seen Jesus, 
but we believe what the Bible says. That is a blessing for us because there's more to this life than what these things see right here. We believe that there is this unseen world that we believe by faith that Jesus is right now praying for you and me. That Jesus died on a cross to, to set us free. That we might have this thing called joy. What well, God's going to give us, what, 80, some of you, if we're for lucky, what, 90 years and that's it? No, no, no. We have an eternity with him. So this is great that we love and worship the God-man, Jesus Christ. Well, he goes on, John says, it says, that which we have seen and heard, he says, we declare this to you, that you also may have fellowship. What's that word for fellowship, men? Koinonia. Koinonia, that's when we get together and have a, have a meal and we talk about Jesus. We can have koinonia with us. It says, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So we have here a, we have some like-minded fellowship. It's good to get together and just uh, talk about how, how Jesus has, has transformed our lives, how Jesus has, has, has set us free. What's so beautiful is that John says we can have fellowship with God. I don't uh, come from a religious background, so I don't uh, know any other religious system than the one that um, was introduced to me, which was Christianity at age 21. But to know that you and I can have fellowship with God, to know that you and I can just at any given time we want, we can come before the presence of God and call him Abba. Isn't that beautiful? We can have fellowship with the creator of the universe. We're going to walk outside and you're going to see the sun. We're going, oh my goodness. I know the one who made the sun. The one who made the sun beckons me, hey, come into my presence. The one who named all of the stars didn't die for them, but he died for me. How beautiful that you and I can have this, this fellowship. John in chapter 14 of his book, he says, uh, speaking of Jesus, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Family, what if our, our walk with God had little to do with the things we say and more to, more to do with what we do? Oh, because it's easy to say, I'd love me some Jesus. Oh, yeah, the Lord is everything in my life. What if somehow God said, you know what, let me put a little zipper on this. Uh, let, me, let me see your love. Many of you probably have a few trees at your house. Think about this. What if somebody in the middle of the night came to your house, dug up all your trees, and put trees in your yard that had no fruit. How would you know what those trees were? Now, some of you might be like a horticulturist, and you're like, well, you check out the leaves. There's no leaves. It's a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. No branches, no anything. How would you know what kind of tree it was? You wouldn't. You would have to wait until it bears fruit. So what if Jesus went into our backyard, and he starts looking at some stuff? What is he going to find? Would he find just us, just, hey, you know, I love me some Jesus. I love me some Jesus. Or is he going to find some, some fruit on those trees? Because listen to what John says. Uh, Jesus says, he who, who has my commandments and what? Keeps them. Keeps them. So it, it has to be something more than just, bah. It says, whoever has my commandments and, and keeps them, it's he who what? If we were to go home right there, that would be a really good point. So if we love Jesus, we would keep his commandments. Now I know sometimes we say, well, we don't want to get into a work system. I wonder why we always default to works when Jesus is calling us up high. He's calling us up high, but then we're like, well, you know, I don't want to really get into a works-based system. We're not talking about works. We're talking about if you love somebody there must be some actions associated with that love. I can't just say I love you and then I don't do what you ask me to do. 
We're going to learn next week about these commands. This is not speaking of the Ten Commandments. This is speaking of, hey, love your neighbor. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, Don't quench the spirit. Um, um, uh, Serve one another. All of these commandments that we have in in the Bible, we're talking about if we love God, we're going to keep these commandments. I love this. It says, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Is that not good? The Father loves you and me because we love us some Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, if you love you some Jesus and we're doing our best to keep his commandments, we are going to be loved by who? By the Father. So, so beautiful. It says, I'm a father and I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. How wonderful are these things? So if we say we love God, we need to keep his commands. Why does John say it? Verse four, he says, and these things I write to you that why? That your joy may be full. We have here B, the truth brings joy. He only mentions truths about God that brings joy. I find it interesting that John didn't say, well, you know, if you just amass a certain amount of wealth, you're going to have some joy. If you can just avoid being sick, you're going to have some joy. You know, if you just buy a house, you get a new car, you know, you get married, have some kids, that's going to bring you joy. Maybe you've been blessed to have all of those things. And you had joy for a little bit, right? Right? Then you're like, oh my goodness, these kids are driving me crazy. You were praying, oh God, give us a kid. 20 years later, God, help us with this kid. <laughs> help us with this situation. He says, I write to you that, I write to you these things that your joy may be full, that our joy has to be in Jesus and in him alone. John's saying, I want you to not be robbed of your joy. I want your joy to be full, knowing who Jesus is, knowing that you can have fellowship with Jesus, knowing that if you keep his commandments, that God the Father is going to love you. You're going to be in some intimate fellowship. I want you to have have joy. Because so often, family, most of us are all adults here, we try to find joy in all kinds of other things. For some reason, our, our heart says, well, just pursue this. And that's going to give you joy. Well, if you can just feel this way, that's going to give you joy. John didn't mention anything about feelings at all. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is joy. Now, I'm not being hyper-religious. I'm simply saying that all of our pursuits in this thing called life are like momentary. Amen? They're just like, okay, oh, well, I got this. And man, it didn't seem to bring me too much joy. But when we have Jesus... Jesus satisfies, amen? What greater love will we ever find than Jesus? Think about that. We can have everything our hearts desired, but don't have Jesus, and we are broke. We are pathetic. But we can have nothing according to the world's terms and have Jesus, and we have everything. The Bible says that this present suffering isn't to be compared with the glory which awaits us. So, so often we're like, well, this is it. No, this, this better not be it. I hope this isn't it. Because how sad if this is it. But we know that there's glory which is awaiting us. And how beautiful it is, family, that this truth brings joy. So when Satan says, oh, your life's always going to be like this, you can say, wait a minute, I just read today in the Bible that God wants my, my joy to be, to be full. What does John say in John chapter 8? It says, you shall know the what? And the truth shall, shall set you free. I love that. The truth has freeing powers. So as things come into your mind, you need to ask yourself, is this truth or is this a lie? I want to meditate on, on what is truth. I want this joy, this that Jesus loves me, that Jesus is real, this truth that can be found in the scriptures. John is saying, I'm letting you know what, what I heard from Jesus, what Jesus told me and how beautiful it is that this love of God family Its purpose is to set us free. Its purpose is to bring us peace and to bring us joy. I don't know where you've been in life. Don't know how your week was. But I'm here to tell you that God loves 
you. That no matter what's going on in your life, it could be falling apart right now. I'm here to tell you that God loves you. And if you say yes to Jesus, if you keep his commands, one day we're going to see Jesus, this little thing called life, these little 85, if we get there, years, pale in comparison to an eternity with our God, King Jesus. Amen. So, so beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Well, verse 5 and 6, it says, this is the message which we have heard from him, and we declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So we have here, secondly, Knowing where to walk. I told you John is a little in your face, right? He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, he's saying we're a bunch of liars. We lie and do not practice the truth. What I love about John is he's saying that what I've heard from God, I'm just declaring it to you. Have you noticed that God is not looking for our popular vote? John's saying that. I'm just telling you what I heard and I'm declaring it to you. That's what I, I'm telling you. And how wonderful it is, he says, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have intimacy and fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Now you might be thinking, well, John, that's a little strong. It's okay to be strong if it's all in truth, right? He's saying that God is light. So if we're saying that we're hanging out with God, but yet we're walking in the darkness, that's, that's a little inconsistent. It's an impossibility to say that we're in fellowship with God and walking in darkness. And so the question is, you know, where are we walking? Are we walking in the light or are we walking in the darkness? The light refers to a few things. The light refers to biblical truth, while darkness refers to biblical error or sin. Proverbs 6 says it like this. For the commandment is a what? Is a lamp. And the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So family, as we as we read our, our Bibles, we read what Jesus is asking us to do. That it actually illuminates. It actually lights our path. It actually says, okay, you're living like this, but this is the way to fellowship. This is the way to, to live to please, to please God. Because we do a really good job at living to, to please self, but the commandment is a wonderful light that says, hey, we need to walk on this path. And John wants the church to know God is not a shade of gray. And that God is, have you noticed that God is kind of like, here's two paths for you. Choose this day whom you'll serve. That's what God is like. He's not, you know, why don't you just kind of roll in the middle? You know, don't go so far to the left. Don't go so far to the right. Just be comfortable and hang out in the middle. Well, what, did, what did Jesus say in the book of Revelation? Since you are lukewarm, I'm going to what? spit you out of my mouth. So if we're just like not really hot, not really cold, we're just kind of, you know what, I don't want to be kind of like a crazy Jesus person. I just want to kind of just sort of kind of be in the game. No, God is like this way or this way. He's, he's, not, he's not a shade of gray. And John is saying that if you're, if you're claiming to have fellowship with him, there's a way that you, that you need to walk. There's a way that you, you need to, to carry yourself. There's, there's a way that you need to, to, to behave. There's a way in which we should live. We can't just say, well, you know what? There's people at our jobs when I was working at a secular job. I love me some Jesus. Really? What did your pastor talk about last week? Well, you know, I haven't been there a little while, but you know what? I don't have to go to church to be saved. You ever heard that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you are saved, you should be in church. Why? Because the book of Hebrews says that we aren't to forsake the what? The gathering together. So for us to have church at home, that's not Bible. That sounds like you, 101. What's great about this text here, it tells us there's a, there's a way in which we're to walk. 
I love it how David Guzik says. He says, John speaks of a walk in darkness, indicating a pattern of living. This does not speak of an occasional lapse, but a lifestyle of darkness, because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. And so John is not talking about a, a lifestyle. John's talking about a lifestyle. It's here. If once in a while we'll have like a little, I slipped. Just get back up. John is talking about if your lifestyle is like just doing your own thing and not following Jesus, he's saying you're, you're not walking in the light. You're not walking in the light. Because it's really easy for us to say, well, you know, the Bible says, you know, thou shalt not judge, you know, and, you know, God is a God of love. John is, quote unquote, the, uh, the writer of, you know, God is love. You know, he's the, he's the one whom Jesus loved. And it's interesting that the one whom Jesus loved is talk, talking to us about living rightly about walking in the light. Here, John's not saying, well, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, you have your, you have your, your pattern of, of living, and you know what? God understands. I wonder if, 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 do you ever wonder what God thinks about? Sometimes when we bring up our, our things to him, you know, well, God, I'm sure you understand. I wonder if he says if you, and I'm talking to myself too, if we, if we would just ask to be filled with his Holy Spirit, if we would just, just plug into the power of his Holy Spirit, that maybe we would live more victorious lives. Because if our mentality is, okay, it's just, it's just, it's just going to be my lot in life. I don't find that in the Bible anywhere. That this is just going to be my lot in life. Just struggle, 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 struggle. And again, I'm talking to myself and talking to you. That there's gotta, I don't think God says, okay, I've left you the comforter who is God, who is all-powerful, and your thoughts are you're going to struggle, 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 struggle. I don't think that's Bible, family. I don't think that's Bible. We should probably pray in a second, but that's not Bible. And that's not Bible. That there's power. There's power to break uh, oppression. There's, there's power to, to deliver. There's power to heal. And again, we're not talking about occasional lapses, but a lifestyle of, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna walk in darkness. Well, John goes on in verse seven, but if we say, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all of our sin. So we have walking rightly has benefits. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we're going to have some, some fellowship with one another. And I love that it says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Think about this. If, if you are a follower of Jesus, not some of your sin is gone. All of your sin is gone. Not just the little stuff. Everything is gone. Listen to this word cleanses. It means to make clean, to remove by cleansing, to free from defilement of sin and from faults, to purify from wickedness, to free from the guilt of sin. I wonder today how many of you are carrying around the guilt of your sin from last week, last month, last year, five years ago, ten years ago. You, you carry it around with you like, like a backpack. Why would you do that if Jesus has set you free? Only a couple amens for that one, huh? Oh, why are you carrying around what has been forgiven? And for some of you, it's going on a decade. You still carry around it here. Well, God, I can't believe I did that 20 years ago. But I'm still going to carry it. God, you know how I failed you five years ago. I know you forgave me, but I just, oh. God says, what are you doing? What are you doing? I guess, why do we hurt ourselves? Why do we hurt ourselves? God says you're free, you're redeemed, you're new. But yet we still hold on to stuff. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from, from all sin. I guess that the, the point is this. It'll sound bad. Who cares what you think? Why does what you think matter so much to you? Why does it what God thinks matter more to you than what you think? How does it say? Did I say that right? You know what I'm talking about, right? So why does what you think matter more than what God says? 
We need to be delivered of what we think. Well, I think this and I feel this. Well, what does what you think or what you feel have anything to do with the eternal, powerful word of God? But that's what we do. I feel a certain way. I think a certain way. So this really doesn't work for me. The eternal word of God doesn't work for you? I mean, is there an asterisk in front of the Bible that says, okay, if you're going through this or this or this, it may not really work for you. That's not the case. So we need to bring our feelings and our emotions, bring it to Jesus. Let's walk rightly. Let's say, God, I don't have my life all together. And God says, I know. <laughs> God, you know, I, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to believe in a certain area. God says, I know. Just walk in the light. God, I'm not sure what you're doing right now. I know. Just walk, walk in my light. God, what's going to happen tomorrow? I know. You don't, but just walk <laughs> in the light. God, I'm feeling a certain way. I know, just walk in the light. But what we do is we take a trip to a dark area. God, I can't see anything. God, it's kind of dark around here. And guess what? I'm by myself. Hmm, so you're like, hmm, there's no light where you are. Hmm, maybe I'll sit down. Maybe I'll just hang out here in the dark. I wonder where God is. I've been praying. I've been even fasting and going to church. Look where you are. So why not ask those questions here? Hey, God, I just want to align myself in the light with all of my questions, my doubts, my fears. I just want to be here because this is, this is where you are. Hey, your word says I need, to, I need to walk with you in the light. Not one time does John say, hey, walk with Jesus in the darkness. He says, walk with Jesus in the light. And it goes on and it says, um, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the, the truth is not in us. Are you offended when somebody says that you're a sinner? Only like four of you like, oh, no, no, oh, no. But there's some of you are like, me, a sinner? That's a sinner. But me, no, 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 no. As John is calling out the church, he's saying, if you say that you have no sin, you, you deceive yourself. Is there anything more uh, habit-forming than self-deception? Is there anything more insidious than, than self-deception? Have you ever been blind to something? Anybody? All right, I'll hug myself. All right, it's just us three. All right, so check it out. So people see it clearly. They're like, this is what's going on. This is what I see. How come you can't see it? You're like, well, man, you know, no, I, this is all good. It's all fine. They're like, you really don't see that right there? You're like, see what? Here, here's some visine. Do, do you see that? No, 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 no. It's that self deception. So John is letting the church know, if you say that you have no sin, you've deceived yourself. And it says, and the truth is not in you. So you're going, John, this is a little strong, John. Earlier you're saying that we're liars. Now you're saying the truth is not in us. We have here B, we have our reality that we are all, we're all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the, the crazy thing is, as we, our first quote um, of uh, the message was, the church isn't in danger of being destroyed. It's in danger of being changed. Yeah. There, there are churches in America that won't talk about sin. Why? That's who we are. That's what we do. So what are we afraid that? Hey, we're going to offend someone, and oh my goodness, you're not going to tithe anymore. Oh no, what's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen if people stop giving money? Oh no, God says, oh, people don't like me anymore. Just give them positive reinforcements. That's going to be okay. So some church services, hey, come instead of sitting on a, on a couch in some psych, um, psychologist's office, come sit in, the, in a pew. Let me make you feel good about yourself. I want you to leave here going 
oh, I feel good about myself. I'm not sure if that's what God's purpose is for us. No amens for that, huh? You know what makes us feel good about self? Is having a right understanding of who we are in God. So that means if we're walking in darkness, hey, why are you walking in the dark? Walk in the light that it's okay for somebody to say, you're in sin right now. That's a beautiful thing because God has something better for you. So why would we just walk past our brothers and sisters that are in clear sin just because we don't want to call anyone a sinner? I mean, I hope this all makes sense. And if you're new with us, welcome to Calvary Beaumont. <laughs> but it's, it's important to understand that this is who we are. We have a sin nature, but God has delivered us from our sin nature. We are redeemed and renewed and restored. But that doesn't mean we never sin. That doesn't mean that we, we have everything right. How was yesterday? Anybody curse? Anybody cut anybody off on the freeway? Anybody yell? Anybody lose their temper? Probably half of us, right? Or half of you, because I didn't do that this week. <laughs> Just a joke. My pastor was on the freeway. He does these things. <laughs> Given the right opportunity, all of us will fall very short of what God has for us. So John says, if you say that you have no sin, says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Listen to first uh, John 1 9. This is so beautiful. It says, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't this beautiful? So you see how John sets it up? Walk in the light, not in the darkness. Let's have fellowship with one another and with God by keeping his commandments. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. If we say we have no sin, there's some issues right here. But if we sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because remember, the Gnostics believed, do whatever you want with this. This is evil. Go, go visit Corinth. Go live it up. Everything is fine because what matters most is your spirit. So John's saying, no, 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 no. This is not how we want to do this, guys. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, ooh, listen to this, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it's okay when the Bible says we're sinners and fallen short of the glory of God. Because if we say this is not true, then we're calling God a liar and his word is not in us. What a beautiful way to start off first, John. Just setting everything straight, setting everything in biblical, biblical form. Let me give you two things to take home with you. The first one is place yourself on joy's path. Place yourself on joy's path. What do I mean? Stand here in the light. Stand here in the light of God. If you're, having, if you're in the habit of, of, of being in the darkness, of just, just you in the darkness, put yourself on joy's path. God, I don't know why I don't have joy. Well, because you're standing in darkness. Come over to the light. And for some of you, that means you need to align your life. Join a, join a life group. Join a men's study or a woman's study. Have some, some fellowship with other people. Don't just hang out by yourself in the dark. Let's align ourselves with the word of God. And then lastly, God cleanses. That's what I love about God. He, he cleans us up like all of us, not just certain parts of our lives. But if we would say, God, this belongs to you, just Clean me up. He's not going to just take your hand and wash a little bit of it and say, okay. What did Peter say? Wash all of me. Not just my head, but just wash all of me. When was the last time we said, God, just wash all of me? God, that just, just wash everything. Just, just take everything, Jesus. Take the part that no one sees and just wash it all. What do you think God's going to say? No. He's going to say, come, come closer. That's like Psalm 51, purge me with hyssop, create in me a, a pure heart, renew a right spirit within me. God, just, just do it all. So it's important to know church, as John was talking to the church back then, he's talking to us today. We can have fellowship with God. We just have to, to walk 
in the light. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for these uh, challenging words from the book of 1 John that we should walk in the light that we might have fellowship, that you, Jesus, that you are our joy, you are our peace and our strength, that it's you, Jesus, that has walked in our shoes. You've died on a cross to save us from all of our sins, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You've risen again from the, from the grave, that we would be justified by faith, that we would be sanctified. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Jesus, help those trees in our backyards to, to start blooming, that we don't just worship you in our words, but that the fruit of our lives would just start to bloom. And Jesus, we do pray that you would fill us anew and afresh with your Holy Spirit. We have power, that dunamis power. We're overcomers. We're more than conquerors. We're not defeated. So Jesus, help us in our mentality to believe what we are because you say so, not because we feel a certain way. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So come, Spirit of God, in your power and wash us from head to toe that we might be on that path of joy because one day, Jesus, we're going to see you. One day, Jesus, all of these struggles and trials, they're going to be gone and we're going to see you face to face. And if you're here today, friend, and you don't know this Jesus we've been talking about, I want to give you the opportunity to invite him into your life and to have him forgive you of your sins, that you might have assurance that when you die, you're going to spend all eternity in heaven. No one's looking around, everyone's eyes closed by just of a raise, raising of a hand. That's your, your action of, of faith. Just by raising your hand would say, yes, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Anybody here this morning? I just want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior.